So, Terry, thank you uh, very much indeed for that absolutely brilliant uh, presentation and insight. Um, if what we normally do is we just uh, get to know our guests with what we call the quick fire round, uh, which is just very short answers to um, very simple questions. Um, What's the favorite thing you like to do when you're not working? Uh, probably reading, I think. Yeah. Your own book. Watching football. <laughs> Yeah. After last Saturday, reading more than watching. <laughs> <laughs> Everton didn't do particularly well. But, right. Are you thinking about managing that club? I'm presumably they might have asked you to come in. And... Uh, I'd, I'd love to manage the club, um, but I, I don't think I'd be very good uh, <laughs> managing the club. No, no. So I think better to be an armchair manager. Yeah. Then you can never be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and we probably see your Irish passion coming out when uh, we're on the football sidelines. Um, do you do a weekly shop, and if so, where? Uh, we, we, uh, we, we do do a, 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 a week. I don't know if it's a weekly shop, actually. I think, I think probably a couple of times a week. And uh, not online. We've never got into the habit of uh, online. And um, it, it, it's Tesco, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the best shop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Terry, to get a little bit closer to your customers, um, when you were the CEO, you went down, you actually worked on the checkout. How were you on the tills? Rubbish. Rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It, it's, um, it, I only would do it like once a year. Uh, and by the time the next year came around, I'd forgotten what I'd <laughs> learned the year before. Um, but... Uh, the system works incredibly well. There are just some things you need to know, yeah. um, and uh, so I was pretty. I was pretty slow. You know. <laughs> once a year, was they'd only let you on once a year. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whilst people, you know, people would would watch anxiously from behind pillars and things. <laughs> Excellent. Um, You've won, uh, as I mentioned, hundreds of business accolades, uh, Sunday Times, um, Business Person of the Year in 2010, HPR, Top 100 CEOs. What, um, is there any other CEO you greatly admire yourself? Uh, I've never been a big hero okay. uh, worshipper. I had, my first hero was, was John Kennedy. And, um, you know, as slowly the sort of revelations as you grow up uh, about his life and everything else, you sort of got slightly deflated. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then whenever, you know, in football we'd have heroes, they'd always leave. So I, I'd always be left bereft. Um, but, but what I have found is that um, uh, lots of people have impressed and influenced me. A lot of them close to home. Um, Ian McLaurin, who was my uh, predecessor at Tesco, was a great sort of club captain, very thoughtful about people. Um, and his colleague, the managing director, David Malpass, who is not well known, was a great thinker and strategist. And they were an amazing combination. And um, David Reed, who I worked with for many years, um, became the chairman of Tesco. Um, he, 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 I learned an awful lot from him. He's such a thoroughly nice man and uh, a decent man. And uh, how he collected um, support, basically because people could trust him and uh, you know, knew what he was about. By the way, you mentioned in there about um, uh, niceness. Uh, some people think to get to the very, very top, you actually have to have a very ruthless underbelly. Is that true? I don't, I don't think it is. Um, I, th I thought it was actually because I, I left the co-op, which was a genteel sort of a place, and um, you know went to join Tesco. I was 23, um, and the salesman who supplied you know the co-op said, "You're going to get eaten alive at Tesco." It was a very sort of sharp elbowed place, and it frightened the life out of me. And, and um, actually, when I went in, there it was a bit of a wild west. This is going back uh, 30, more than 30 years. And it was sort of very male, very testosterone, shout people down and things like that. And I actually did have to become sort of quite tough to survive. Um, and uh, in, in my early years, because they'd think, well, who is this upstart in his 20s, you know, telling us what to do? What does he know? Um, and, um, but, but then gradually watching other people, I, I realized that, uh, you know, you don't have to sort of be sharp elbowed all the time. You, um, uh, you just be yourself, let people know who you are, um, and uh, you, you find that if you're consistent in how you behave, 
people feel they can rely on you and trust you. Just going back, if we can, all the way to your early years, just very quickly, give us a picture of what it was like growing up in Liverpool. You, you had prefab house, is that right? Not very... Yeah, yeah. My, um, we, we, uh, the, the prefabs, it was a council estate, and, yeah. and, the, and the prefabs were meant to be temporary houses uh, built on the outskirts of uh, Liverpool. My, my mum was a, a nurse, part-time nurse, and my dad was a sort of a greyhound trainer and gambler. Okay. And um, is that where you get your risk quotient from? Mm? Is that where you get your risk? Possibly, from? yeah, yeah, possibly. <laughs> um, and uh, we kept greyhounds in the back garden in a in a in a World War Two uh, radio uh, hut, uh, which was actually bigger than the prefab that we lived in uh, <laughs> at the front. And um, it, it was a sort of um, unreliable existence because uh, you know sometimes my dad would make some money on the dogs and sometimes. He wouldn't. Mm. Uh, but it was a very loving family. And uh, I suppose the big thing, I, I, and they were very unconditional parents, very unconditional love. Mm. And uh, I, I think that gives you a huge security. It's much easier to trust other people if, yeah. if you know, you, you, you've been loved, I think. Your early years, I mean, you said in your book um, that you learned good manners, education, hard work, common sense, and the respect for others. So all very noble, good things for leaders and businesses. But did your early years somehow have with the origins of your massive determination and your massive drive to succeed did that somehow were they born in your early years well yeah I, I think that's not unusual and um, you know if you, if you if you don't have much by way of background uh, you're probably insecure uh, and uh, um, uh, it's no secret that's why so many businesses are founded by immigrants uh, uh, and that because you feel you've got no safety net, so you know you've got to do it for yourself. Uh, and I think I was very fortunate in in you've got that drive, uh, but also um, both at school, in the church, in the family. You know, I felt I was taught good values, so that when I went off to try and achieve those things, I, I ultimately I think went about it in the right way. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, so that I was a, it was a fortunate combination. Yeah. So it's a little bit of fear of failure has driven you to some. Oh yeah, without yeah, without question. Yeah. And I think that's pretty common. Whatever drives you, it's a good thing, I presume. Um, so Terry, but let's just talk about work-life balance, right? I mean, you uh, are married to Alison. You've got three kids. You used to work seventy to eighty hour weeks. How did you manage that work-life balance, or does the work-life balance? term just go out of the window when you've got to get as successful as you have been? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I th probably it does go out of the window. So what, what, the thing that worked for me was uh, not to try and separate, you know, family and work and, right. and not to try and get a balance, okay. um, but, but actually just became one thing. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, there was, work and family or family and work I, you'd have to ask Alison which order uh, it was in uh, and um, so what that meant was um, you know if I needed to take time off to go to the school or whatever I would if I needed to work at the weekend I would you know so so in other words you used all the hours in in uh, the week um, on just on two things family and uh, and work um, <coughs> I think um, it's inevitable Alison's career, um, you know, she became part-time and so uh, it's very common that you'll get one person who feels a bit frustrated because they feel they have to take a back right. seat, really. Right. Uh, and I think that's very common uh, a problem. Uh, She's a you, doctor, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then the kids, they seem all right. <laughs> Because you, you actually have said in your book that you're relatively shy. Now, you don't seem it at all, but uh, it does say, I was a relatively shy guy from a council estate and an unlikely ch chief executive. I'm quite happy not to be in the limelight, so apologies for today. Um, but uh, you seem very natural. So, you know, you're, you're passionate about face-to-face -face communication and you had over 300,000 employees, so presumably you just had to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, I was painfully shy, um, you know, even by the standards of a council estate in Liverpool. Um, and, um, uh, but, but I just had to take, um, 
a deep breath and and get on with it. And and then of course you get used to it. Yeah. But it never goes away. Actually, you, really? yeah, I'm still shy. Uh, and I, I don't know whether it's nurture or nature or or, or whatever. But mm. um, uh, it, it's just you know part of your personality. But in some ways, there's a new uprising. A lot of books being written about the power of introverted, well, introverted or or quieter people. Um, do you think in some ways that has helped you? And and what piece of advice would you give to other quiet, quieter people out there that you know trying to get ahead in uh, the very noisy world that we live in? Yeah, I think I think I I think it does help um, being introverted in in two ways. What one is that you tend to watch more and listen. Um, you're more watchful, um, and and that helps. Um, you, you know, uh, you're you're less confident. Um, you know, all the sort of psychology, we're not particularly good instant judges of risk and our environment. So being more watchful, more cautious mm -hmm. is a good check on that. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other aspect of introversion is you tend to use yourself and your beliefs as your reference point. And again, that's quite a good thing for consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and people can, can, can feed off that. You know, if you're all over the place on issues, you know, if you agree with the last person you spoke to or you change your views in order to, for it to be fashionable or whatever, that's, you know, following that is hard to do uh, yeah. for an organization. Yeah. But, but if you can sort of, you know, um, you know, follow a fairly consistent path, I think that helps, <coughs> uh, that mm -hmm. helps people. So, so my message to um, all the shy people out there <laughs> Is, is speak up and be yourself and, and, and um, don't try to be how you imagine successful people should be. Uh, don't worry about being charismatic or saying the right things or being seen in the right situations. Just, just be yourself, but open up enough so people can see who you are. Great, yeah. Because you write about it in the book again, it's all about being authentic, right? So just yeah. being yourself. If we can talk about Tesco and now, so Terry, um, you have, um, you know, you, you actually led, as I wrote, in, as I mentioned in my introduction, one of the Britain's greatest turnarounds. So we're going to go into some detail, but just to make sure I get the top level things uh, ticked off. On a macro level, how did you actually achieve it? What are those few things, as you mentioned in your speech, that you actually did right? Well, I, I, I think, um, I mean, you know, it, it sort of looks well planned in hindsight. I mean, actually, um, what it was actually about was not failing, you know. Um, uh, but, but I think that this idea of really y using information to really focus on what customers wanted um, proved to be tremendously powerful because it provided a very a single purpose that the whole organization could fall in behind. Mm. Um, uh, uh, again, often when you see organizations struggle, it's because they're pursuing multiple um, agendas uh, and often they're, they're, they're conflicting. Mm. Uh, so, so there's a single clear uh, purpose. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, some of the mm. values and the work on culture proved to be a very effective way of motivating and engaging people behind that, that focus, that purpose. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and I, I think because we were behind, we had less to lose. Um, and so we're more prepared to innovate yeah. and to take some risk. And the interesting thing is, you know the old joke about uh, can you outrun that bear? And you, you know, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. Yeah. Um, well, it's the same with a competitor. You know, you, you just have to do things relative to where the competitor is. And we were prepared to innovate more than those two very fine businesses. Mm. And I think because they liked the environment that had made them number one. Mm. 
So they were more reluctant to change that environment, change that world. Whereas we didn't like the environment that had made us a distant number three. (coughs) So we were more prepared to try something new. So that challenge in mentality that you're talking about there when you're number two or number three, it's it's a great driving force because you see them as the target. But when you're actually the number one leader, as you have been for many years in Tesco, how do you actually make sure that you continue to get the sort of um, that gusto and that drive when you're number one so you can't actually go any higher? Well, it's very difficult. And, um, you know, uh, being paranoid helps. Um, (laughs) And um, sort of constantly um, putting yourself under pressure. um, Because if you put yourself under pressure, there's less chance of somebody else putting you under pressure. And and actually just being a pain in the backside, um, which is very wearing as a CEO. Um, I mean, I'd love to come in and each morning and actually bring some sunshine into the room but mainly you came in <laughs> and brought rain because you were you know constantly pointing out that uh, we needed to do more or things could be done better or or whatever so um that's the way of doing it but you know there's a natural cycle with these things or all, all even businesses that are successful they rise and then they fall mm. and there's nothing you can do about it the only thing you can do is try and make the period between the rise and the fall as long as possible. Is that one of the reasons why you got out, presumably? Was you realised that? No, I mean, but, but <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. But, but I, 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 one of the reasons why I got out was because I knew there was only so much an organisation could put up with from me. Uh, and, and there is a danger that if you do something for too long, you know, your way of doing things, your manner, it's just less effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've done it for 14 years, which is longer, yeah. longer than normal, I think. Yeah, because you're quite a young, you started at yeah. 40 years yeah. as a CEO. And, but talking about that, just very briefly, if we can, uh, the day that you resigned, £778 million pounds has just wiped off the value of Tesco. Um, so, uh, on, on a personal note, I actually had shares in the company, so I wish you'd called me, but um, I think there's, there's laws against that. And, uh, um, but, um, you know, Tesco, since you left, hasn't fared as well. Um, you could say it's the economic change, but then you left in 2011, so that was still a poor economy. So, is it just that you're not in charge? No, I, I think that, um, well, first of all, no organisation, you know, has got a a right to be successful all the time. I mean, businesses go up and down all the time. And uh, um, th- this recession is, is uh, unprecedented. It's, uh, basically, it's the consumer pressure, which is, affects Tesco most, started in 2007, the summer of 2007. And, and has gone, and, and it's gone on till the present time, you know, mm. where a, a real spending power is being reduced year on year. And um, I, I think the thing that really complicated matters was the spike in commodity prices mm. in 2010, 11. And that really derailed uh, the, the, the recovery. Mm. Uh, now, so five years of recession, any consumer business is going to be showing a bit of wear and tear. Uh, and, I, and I think that um, uh, my successor, Philip, has done the right thing, which is to invest in order to, you know, like I said earlier, try and change some of the rules in the game. Right. And uh, he's, you know, t- he's, he's taken a, a, a holiday on profits in order to try and improve the competitive the competitiveness of the business. Um, and uh, and you, you also need luck, you know, you, the, the, the 11th word up there would have been luck. Okay. Um, the only problem with luck is you can't, it's not on tap, you know, you can't bring it in when you need it. it wasn't lucky enough to be included in your top 10. <laughs> no. Bad joke, I apologise to everybody. Um, but also I understand Philip Clark actually bought, I don't know, I read this somewhere, might, he bought a house opposite you. Is that, so you could pop in and ask for some... No, I mean, um, okay, so, so Terry, you know, Jeff Bezos um, on Amazon.com says that he's got a video out there saying that all the things that he knows about success in business, having done Amazon.com, is only three or four things. And and number one, he says, and I quote, um, the first thing I know is that you have to obsess over your customers. So you're hand in hand uh, when it comes to that. Um, but a lot of people say that they're obsessed by their customers or they're customer-centric. But in actual fact, they 
you know, they're not really living and breathing. They don't give, they don't give monkeys about customers sometimes. So how can you make sure that an organization really does have the customer at the heart of what they do? Yeah, everyone says the same thing. Uh, I, I think that the, the test is, is the extent to which you do it. So um, in that example, we, we did develop whole new techniques in bringing in knowledge about the customer, yeah, some of which were, you know, world's first, like Club Card. Uh, so that was done on a large scale. Um, and then uh, we did change the structure of the organization a lot so that that information found its way to where the decisions were being made, right to the heart of the organization. Uh, so often there's a lot of data in a business, but it's trapped down uh, you know, in the bowels of the business. And you get almost an inverse pyramid where the people who make the biggest decisions know the least yeah. uh, at the top of the organization. So, so I think that is, is important. And then the third thing is we really push this idea of serving the customer to every corner of the business, not just the marketing people or the store people, everybody, you know, literally, you know, accountants, distribution people, store planners, everybody. Uh, the question they were asking is, you know, what I'm about to do now, how is it going to benefit a customer? Mm. You know, not, not, not an internal customer, but the customer. Talking about the customer for a second, you um, you mentioned uh, in there about um, how customer you could be customer centric, but but many people, including Demings, for example, quote innovation comes from the producer, not the customer. So, you know, in Ed de Bono, that I know you you know well, um, he says generally customers are great at giving feedback on what you're not doing particularly well, but they're very unlikely to give you massive insights that are going to innovate and drive your business uh, forward. Steve Jobs probably agrees with that. Can they? The big innovations? I, I think they can, yes. And um, uh, it's interesting you say about Steve Jobs, you see, because I think his genius was actually translating technology into a form that would help people in their lives. And I think that was mm. a, as much observational, his insight into mm. people's lives, as it was his insight into the technology. Right. Um, but, but, but I think, um, you know, we, we found that if you just observe in a very broad sense, people's lives, almost in an anthropological sense, um, you know, needs will emerge that are not being met. So you have a chance of, as an organization to be the one that meets that need. Right. And uh, I use the example of uh, Tesco Express. You know, the industry logic, the innovators in the, you know, if mm. you like, said the big stores were what worked. The economics of the industry everywhere in the world was big stores. But actually, when you sp spoke to ordinary people, they said we're getting busier and busier in our lives. Even though they were working less hours, uh, life's just more complicated. Uh, we have less time to go to big stores. Um, and so, you know, against the industry wisdom, we developed miniaturized stores that we could then place, you know, adjacent to people in high streets and office parks and university campuses and villages. Uh, which were Tesco Express, which actually proved to be hugely successful. Uh, and, and Tesco Express, the turnover is in billions of pounds. There are thousands of them all over the world, not just the UK. And, and they're the most popular format. Now, now, that innovation, which was highly profitable, came from listening to what customers were saying about their lives. Yeah, because I, Tesco, Tesco, can you just tell us very briefly, Tesco.com, um, it was uh, back in 1995, you went to some exhibition uh, and you spotted that trend. Can you just tell us that story? Yeah, um, I, I went with uh, my colleague Tim Mason to uh, a, 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 um, an installation that was called the, the, the Store of the Future. And it was done by Anderson Consulting, who are now Accenture. Yeah. And um, we went along sort of reluctantly and um, um, had a look around. It was quite good, actually. Uh, and then the final uh, exhibition uh, was um, a kitchen, somebody's kitchen. This is 1995. Uh, and there was a computer in the kitchen, which you'll have to think back, but that was very odd, because if you had a computer, you certainly didn't have it in your kitchen then. And so we all asked the curator, you know, why, why is there a computer in the kitchen? They said, ah, one day people will be able to order their shopping, you know, their food shopping from home. Well, we all fell about laughing. We thought that was absolutely ridiculous. And um, 
we, we, we spent about an hour telling him why that would never work, you know, in terms of how, <laughs> how, how would you communicate the order, who would pick it, and how would you deliver it, and so on and so forth. <coughs> anyway, so um, as we left, Tim and I just said, but, but customers would like it, wouldn't they, if you could do that? It, you know, I mean, I know it's ridiculous, but it would, it would be really popular. Yeah. Anyway, within six months, we'd launched Tesco.com. Uh, and, and, and the point there being that, um, you, you know, the lesson is we learned is, is, is don't question what a customer wants. See, you know, work out a way of seeing if you can actually meet that need and make mm. a living out of it. Mm. But, but, but you had the foresight and the insight to spot that. And also cost, uh, Tesco Express, I think the idea came to you in a car park, right? So, so do you start, I guess you, as leaders, you just need to be switched on to ideas, innovation. Well, yeah, I, I think there's a great advantage of, for people in an organization just to have the radar switched on all the time to look at the world around them. And uh, that's tough in, in organizations because the pressure's always on. You know, you've got your nose to the grindstone yeah. and deadlines and what the boss wants. And, you know, that's not my job to look over there. But, but actually, just being curious about the world and mm. how it's changing and what the implications of that change are for your organization is incredibly valuable. Mm. Yeah, particularly also because people are less courageous. I mean, as you said, they're very, very busy. But in a downturn, generally, people will be more risk adverse. So how, how can you create that culture of you know, a healthy appetite for a risk and therefore, I guess, failure in a downturn like this? Well, I, I think encouraging people to look around uh, and, and be curious and be interested, um, giving people time to do that. Um, I, I, I think not punishing failure is, is, is the key. Um, and uh, well, well, first of all, not shouting down an idea, um, mm. but then not punishing failure. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're the key ingredients yeah. to getting an organization to try new things. Fantastic. Um, if we can just briefly on innovation, last thing, um, more and more people are getting worried as CEOs that there's going to be a new competitor comes in from emerging markets, or there's going to be a new technology that just wipes out their business. And so people, like, you know, if we look at, unfortunately, HMV as an example, um, you know, they, people are having to really focus on business model innovation. So. Uh, what advice would you give to CEOs and businesses, really, on making sure they are innovating at the business model level? Yeah. Um, well, you, you know, confront the truth. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the, uh, digitization, I think, someone will correct me, w was known in the mid-70s, I think. Mm. Uh, Kodak knew about it in the mid-70s. But for whatever good reason, felt unable to do anything fundamentally about it. And then the business expired. 30 years later right so so they knew for 30 years mm. uh so so you know face face the truth of what's what's coming you know yeah. the rise of china you know uh the aging demographic um uh, climate change you know big forces that are happening uh and and um then then be hopeful uh in other words believe that however bad it looks you know, you can survive it if you're prepared to change enough in order to confront it. And, yeah. I, and I think often what, what you see is businesses don't feel they can cope with it, so they just shrink away. And sometimes in the worst examples, the CEO thinks, well, you know what, I'm here for three years. Yeah. You know, the share price is X, my yeah. bonus is Y, I'll just keep it calm get out the yeah. way, leave it for the next guy. Mm. Uh, and I think that really lets the organization mm. down. The sad thing about owners on public markets is the average ownership period is eight months. Mm. So they're thinking, yeah, I see your point, but mm. not while I'm owning the shares. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm just worried about the price when I sell the shares. Mm. And, and so you can, there can be a vacuum there right where you need it in terms of strategic leadership. Um, but, so Terry, you hate bureaucracy as well. I mean, um, Alan Layton, who I know, is the, the former chairman of the Royal Mail and uh, a good friend of yours. Um, when he appointed Adam Crozier, the CEO of um, ITV now, but back then, uh, the Royal Mail, uh, he sent Adam down to the post office at 4.30 in the morning to get him to deliver the mail in order to sort of get to know the business. 
You do something very similar, don't you? You send all your management team to, to get to know the customers and the business down to the tills and the checkouts once a year, is that right? Uh, yeah, I used to work for a week as a general assistant every yeah. year, and, and, and the deal I did with the sort of top 3,000 managers was they would work a week as well. And um, I think it's a very good thing. You, you, yeah. you get to see the business from a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, you're on the receiving end of your own decisions, yeah. which can be very sobering. <laughs> um, uh, and it keeps you in touch with what the business is about and what yeah. the jobs that most people actually do. Yeah. Keeps you humble as well. It would have yeah. been good if one or two people had done that in terms of border control, you know, the queues at uh, yeah. Heathrow, if, uh, <laughs> if they'd sat on the desk there. <laughs> The horse meat scandal, um, it had nothing to do with you, it wasn't on your watch at all, um, but having observed it outside of the business and outside of the retail sector, how do you think Tesco or the overall industry has responded to that situation? It's sort of hard to comment from the outside, I'm a little reluctant to do it, but um, I think that when these um, uh, crises take hold, the, it's certainly in a media context, it's actually quite difficult to control them. They're like a firestorm. Um, mm. So, so uh, my advice would be never try to control the media firestorm itself. Actually address the issue yeah. and then let the media firestorm take care of itself. It'll either burn itself out or not. It's not right. You can't control it. Mm. Make sure that you know what the issue is and you're doing the right thing on the issue. I, I think that um, I in that regard, the industry did reasonably well. Um, you know, they came out and spoke on the subject. Um, and by the way, just by some facts, um, Tesco um, pr produces meat in 1,000 factories around the world. And there were two instances of horse meat. And in those two instances, it was due to fraud because Tesco had specified precisely the suppliers of the meat going into the factories, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a fraud. And um, uh, these were, it, was, it was not caused by pressure on the supply chain or price pressure. These were large, well-invested multinational businesses. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, you know th those are the facts. Um, and sometimes you, you, you know, you can't, it's very understandable that the idea of um, you know, the provenance of your food uh, n not being uh, reliable is, 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 is a shock to people. But those, those, were, those were the facts. Thank you for answering that one. So, um, so Terry, you must get asked quite a lot of times. I mean, when you're as successful as you have been or as Tesco has been, then sometimes there is, um, you know, you're going to get criticised as well as getting massive raving fans. And I suppose some of the people out there which would be criticising is to say that, well, if you go down to the average village or town, then there's boarded up stores because of the success of Tesco. So would you say uh, that somehow, or do you have any sympathy for um, the sort of negative byproduct of your success is the boarded up stores in the downtown areas? Well, I, I certainly have sympathy for the concern um, and sympathy for the argument that uh, if any, you know, of a business or an organisation is, is successful, mm -hmm. um, then people want to know how it's been successful and that that, that has not come at a price for somebody else uh, or for yeah. society. Uh, so, so having a debate and, and explaining you know, why you've been successful, how that's in the interests of society is, is perfectly legitimate. Mm. I, th I think that, um, you know, the benefits for many, the small benefits for many, uh, do outweigh the losses for the few. But if you're one of the few, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. So if you're the butcher that's been put out of business, mm. it doesn't feel like progress that thousands of people, you know, that they're that their weekly income goes further because of supermarkets. And that's always a difficult balance to strike. Right. Um, and, but it, you know, it, it is part of progress, and progress is messy. You know, for every winner, there's a loser. Mm. Um, uh, the, the, the whole uh, evolution of man is around specialization, where yeah. you know, some people can do things better than others. And it's tough if you're the one who you know, it, it yeah. doesn't do it as well. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but, 
you know, that's part and parcel of progress. Yeah. And yeah. that's why they have competition commissions to, just to check that the public interest on balance is served. Yeah. Uh, and why Ashfield gives us such <laughs> wonderful support. <laughs> <laughs> and as you mentioned, uh, the public there, I mean, at the end of the day, it's with consumer, you know, customers decide they want to shop. Uh, we are, the Harvard Business Review uh, did an interview with Jeff Bezos, actually, um, and they asked a very similar question. So disruption, Harvard Business asked, so disruption is obviously a rough business. Do you have any personal regrets about the pain that your success has caused to traditional retailers? To which he responds, I'm just as sentimental as the next person. I have a lot of childhood memories of physical books and things like that. Our job at Amazon is to build the best customer experience we can in every way and then let the customers choose where to shop, right? So it's a very similar thing. You, you've created it and at the end of the day you're not telling your customers where to go. Yeah, I, 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 th I think in the end that's it, that uh, as long as the customer makes a conscious choice and as long as other people, you know, so, so uh, all big businesses start as small businesses. Yeah. Uh, and um, as long as they got to be big uh, in fair competition, and then as long as when they're big, they don't stop other small businesses toppling them. Right. That's that's a, that's, that's all you can ask for. Final question, to Terry. Um, I'm sure you've um, since you left Tesco. I'm sure you haven't had any worries about keeping the electricity on or, or going out there and applying for lots of uh, jobs. Um, you've probably been inundated with jobs. I understand even Sir Paul McCartney has asked you to join his band. Um, <laughs> But um, what is the future for, for Sir Terry Lee? What is the audacious goals, or what is it you're going to be going and doing? I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, for me, because I grew up in Tesco, there'll never be another job like Tesco, mm. um, so I wouldn't try. Mm. But I'm still in business, and I invest uh, in small startups, uh, I, people I like, ideas I like. I, I, I work with the, um, you know, the founder, the owner. Uh, in, in growing their business. The businesses are all very vibrant. It's very interesting. The, yeah. the problems don't change. Yeah. Um, but um, so, so that keeps me busy, and I, and, yeah. I, and I do it on a slightly larger scale as a partner in a private equity firm. It's the yeah. same idea, you know. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So uh, I have a lot of fun. Yeah. Fantastic. As a founder, being able to call and speak to your angel investor, Sir Terry, to get some advice on the business, you couldn't get any better than that, I wouldn't have thought. I hope so. My name's Jenny Baxter. I'm from the BBC. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about innovation, and you mentioned a couple of the really big innovations that happened in Tesco while you were there. And I just wondered whether your frank and honest view about innovation is that this is about a few key individuals in the top team making the right calls, obviously being exposed as you were uh, to the online marketing idea um, was, was, a, was a sort of breakthrough moment for Tesco, but that was again exposure to, for those senior leaders who then went away and quite quickly decided what to do. I just wonder how you weigh that against what a lot of companies are doing at the moment, which is trying to foster innovation at every level, have a kind of program that is encouraging everybody to think in different ways, and whether you think the first is likely to be more successful than the second? I mean, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, I think, um, because they probably are speaking about an, an openness to change, a mindset that uh, is prepared to um, try new things. Um, on the, answering you honestly, I think it's a big advantage if the key decision makers are able to think in terms of innovation. Uh, I mean, my background was marketing. Uh, you, you, we, I, it would be better if there were more CEOs who had backgrounds in, in marketing or new technology. Um, um, there are perhaps a few too many CEOs who are former finance directors. Um, uh, and uh, also, even though in that example of you know going to the dot com exhibition or whatever, um, it probably wouldn't have got anywhere if 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 if, if then all the people in the organisation hadn't been open minded and been prepared to do all the necessary experiments and you know turn the idea into a, a reality. Uh, so so I think. Um, you, you need both. You know, you need you need um, an, 
an approach, an attitude towards change through the organization. Um, Alan Carruthers from Ocado. Um, how do you see the future of online grocery and its impact on traditional bricks and mortar stores and, and the kind of the general future of grocery? Well, uh, <clears throat> obviously e-commerce will continue to grow uh, faster than uh, traditional retail. Um, it's hard to see where it will level out. It will level out at different penetration levels in different categories. So um, obviously pure information, I don't know, banking could be 100% uh, online. Um, electronic goods, very high percentage. But possibly grocery will be one of the lower uh, percentages, um, but still, you know, much higher than it is today. Uh, the UK, by the way, is, is the world's leading uh, e-commerce uh, economy. Uh, much higher penetration online than any other country, uh, which is a big advantage for us uh, in terms of you know creating new businesses and the economy. Because one of the benefits of e-commerce is you can go cross-border much more easily than than you can with with bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it may be that, that you know, e-commerce is, is just a, a faster growth dynamic like discount retailing or convenience retailing. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just a form of distribution that, that, that is more popular because it meets needs today. Uh, it may not be more dramatic than that. I mean, I think it'll settle down because... Um, customers won't distinguish between online and offline the way we in the industry do. They'll just uh, want to go shopping. And, um, you know, they'll want to move seamlessly between what we call online and offline. And they'll, they'll th think, as they always do, in terms of products and brands. Uh, Raju Sidhu from City. Um, so, Terry, what was the most difficult decision you made as CEO at Tesco? I'm not sure, actually. Um, they all seemed difficult at the time. <laughs> I, I, um, in fact, they were so difficult. Um, I, I always avoided rushing to a decision. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a great procrastinator. And um, I, I think it's not a bad idea, that, you know, because... Um, you know, if you turn things over, often it, it does become clearer. So, so um, I, I never, I never felt the need to, to, you know, to make a quick, to make a quick decision. Um, I, th I think I always tried to distinguish between, um, you know, things that didn't matter really, and you could make decisions all the time, or actually make no decision and let somebody else get on with it. Um, and a few things that really mattered, that, or that I thought that really mattered, and, and those ones you had to be really careful about, about what you decided. And um, I always tried to avoid the one decision that would bet the company. I, 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 I never went there. And um, th there were opportunities to do it, and other businesses did it. Um, and if you pull it off, you look like a hero. And if you don't pull it off, that's the end of the business. And I just felt that that risk wasn't, wasn't worth it. Hi, Sir Terry. Uh, Mark Silverside from Macmillan Cancer Support. Um, really interested to hear about your emphasis on values and culture. I just wondered if you could comment on um, the value you placed on CSR and things like charity partnerships. Um, well, I, in terms of Tesco or business generally or... Well, Tesco's in particular because um, you've got a very strong um, or had a strong um, partnership with yeah. um, Cancer Research UK yeah. over many years, but I suppose more generally as well. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, t t Tesco what was, is very active in, in, in that area. It started off as, you know, just doing your bit, I suppose. Um, we, we, we then thought more about it, and uh, actually as we spoke to customers and they said you know we think you're great for us as customers we're not so sure about what you do in the community so it's this interesting uh, you know facet of people that they're both citizens and consumers at the same time 
And, and so we, 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 we had to be more, you know, more considered, more strategic about what we did for the community. And that steering wheel used to have four segments, now it's got five. And we, we it used to be customer, staff, work, how we design work and finance. And then we added community as a fifth. And, 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 and we were careful to take the same sort of rigorous approach to that side of things that we did on the customer or workplace or finance, same measures, you know, similar measures and so on, same accountability. Uh, I mean, I think in the end, um, the best form of CSR is have a business that, 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 that the, the core purpose of the business is valuable to society. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's probably the best contribution that businesses can make. Hi, I'm Susie Young from Waitrose. Um, kind of a linked question, actually. You talked about the short-termism of shareholders and some of the sort of behaviours that that can drive in CEOs and their, perhaps their short-term thinking. And I just wondered whether you thought perhaps that shareholder model, how sustainable that might be for sort of thinking about the wider stakeholders in society and, and whether you think there's any alternatives in the future. Well, I think the model can work very well. Uh, you know, the great advantage of um, uh, equity is, is it spreads risk. And, and so it's a great source of finance. Um, it, it's a great way of people using their savings. Uh, and remember, most you know, equity in the UK comes from insurance funds and pension funds and so on. Um, I, but but uh, you know in in in, the, in its strength I think also lies the weakness because then it's hard to actually characterise who the owner is who really is the steward of the business when the owner is actually thousands hundreds of thousands of uh, individuals um, so 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 uh, you know if I could wish for something I, I would wish for the owners to act more like owners. Um, and, and be more involved uh, in the business. Um, and, um, but, but, you know, as a, as a model, I think it, 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 it works, it can work very well. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have to end it right now. Um, so, I just wanted to say thank you all again for, for being with us here today. It's been fantastic. Uh, to have you. And I just want to, to say, uh, so Terry Leahy's book, as you know, is called Management in Ten Words. Probably about a week ago, I had a dream uh, that he refused to say anything else but the ten words when he was up here. So, but he, sh he shared a lot more than that. So um, I just wanted to end it by giving you a massive round of applause uh, and a massive thanks to Sir Terry Leahy. Thank you. Thank you very much.